Okay, so let's do one more topic in finance before we move on to financial economics. Week 9. And the topic is efficient market hypothesis. Efficient market hypothesis. I think many of you have heard of this word, efficient market hypothesis. But this word is used in more than one meaning, which causes sometimes confusion. So today, let's summarize this topic. First, there was an old image of this word, efficient market hypothesis. And that was, OK, there was old interpretation or old image. And that was random work hypothesis. That is, the stock price follows a random work process. Or in other words, the change, the stock return, is an IID process. So every period, the return can be positive or negative. And consequently, the stock price can go up or go down. One implication of random walk hypothesis is that the expected return is always constant. And another implication is that the variance <coughs> of the return is also constant over time. The expected return constant being constant means what? The McDonald's expected return is always 2%. Of course, the actually realized return can be 5% or 10%. It can be negative 5% or negative 10%. But in expectation, it's always 2%. OK? People could buy such a story. So people say, maybe, to this first interplica uh, inter implication. But to the second implication, people say, no. The variance cannot be constant. We know that once in a while, you know, think about some uh, events like Great Depression or financial crisis. It doesn't have such serious uh, matters. But once in a while, there is a period of, of a lot of uncertainty and volatility and fluctuation. So once in a while, the stock market experiences some turmoil. Okay? So the variance cannot be constant. So in 1960s, Paul Samuelson modified this idea. And that was Martin Gale, Martin Gale, Martin Gale hypothesis. That Samuelson Okay, people say random walk, but people don't really mean IID return. What they mean is return is so unpredictable. They only talk about expectation. So the price is price is martingale. Price is a martingale process. And hence, the expected return, if you don't know Martingale, just Google it. The important part is the next. The expected return 
based on the currently available information i is constant. Okay, it doesn't depend on today's information. This it is includes all information currently available available at date t. So it can be um, I don't know weather or it can be anything weather or. Uh, today's mood of the king or some market information such as the most recent return or the amount of dividends paid now or current price or their ratio the ratio is called dividend yield or other macro variables such as government bond interest rates or GDP or unemployment rate or inflation and so on. Okay? Now if you form the expected return, expectation of the future return based on the currently available information, that expectation doesn't depend on that information at all. Okay? Which implies that the technical analysis, sometimes people carefully look at the you know, chart, the historical movement of the stock prices, the Martingale hypothesis says, no, that's not very meaningful. The expectation is always constant. Of course, there can be cross-sectional difference in return, in expected return across companies. It's possible that JP Morgan or Ford have high expected return like 5% while Colgate, uh, McDonald's, Pepsi have relatively low expected return 2%. There can be cross-sectional difference across companies, but in time series, if it's 2%, then it's always 2%. Expected return is always 2%. Yeah? The antonym to this is predictable return. which says that, well, it's just opposite. The expectation of the future return based on the current, currently available information depends on that information. Now, at this point, you should be careful about what predictability means in economics and finance. Your friend is going to roll a dice, and you say, I think the dice will show six. And he rolls his dice, and you say, see, I told you. That's not what predictability means in economics and finance. In economics and finance, predictability doesn't mean foretelling the actual realization beforehand. OK, predictability is about distribution, or in particular, expectation. The expected number of spots the dice shows is 3.5. If you always say 3.5, okay, the expectation, my expectation is 3.5. Next time, again, 3.5. Next time, again, 3.5. If your expectation is always constantly 3.5, then it is called that the outcome is unpredictable. <laughs> if you have some extra information like, okay, the expectation was 3.5, but this time you are very lucky so the expectation is 4.5. Or, you know, this time I can see, it's very subtle, but I can see that the one corner of the dice is slightly chipped. So the expectation is 2.9. If the expectation changes over time, depending on your information, then it is said that the outcome has, you know, there is some predictability, okay? Now, that's, there's another definition and that's a farmer's definition.
And that is also called informational efficiency. Informational efficiency. Which basically says this, this is another interpretation of, well, this is another meaning. I mean, again, efficient market hypothesis, this word is used in different meanings. And this is, sometimes investors use this word in this sense, informational efficiency, which basically says asset prices already reflect all information. in the market. New information is immediately priced into assets. Let's say your friend and you both have a lot of shares of Volkswagen. And there is, on BBC, there is breaking news, emission scandal. Volkswagen was cheating on the emission test. Okay, so the prospect of company immediately deteriorates. Your friend was watching this breaking news and he immediately sold his, all his shares of Volkswagen. While you were enjoying comfortable dinner with your family, you missed the news and you didn't sell the shares. Would you make more loss than your friend because you missed the news? Information efficiency says not necessarily, no. When your friend sold, his shares, as soon as he watched the news, the share price was already low. After that, the share price can recover or further drops depending on the new arrival of further information. Okay? That's one implication of this information efficiency. The information is immediately reflected. It's too late if you just watch the news. Okay? Another in implication of informational efficiency is that if you observe some prices that look unreasonably low, well, this informational efficiency says, no, they're not cheap. They look unreasonably low because you are missing some risk information. You are overlooking some risk <coughs> that many other investors are aware of. Okay? That's why they look, the price looks low. But it's not cheap. You're just missing some information. So that you are overlooking some risk. This is in contrast to what behavioral economists would say. So behavioral economists view. Behavioral economists think well, it is possible that it is unreasonably low. It is possible that many other investors are simultaneously irrational once in a while. Okay? And in that case, you can exploit that. Another implication of informational efficiency is that the expected return of an asset is equal to investors discount rate, and it's also equal to required return, the expected return required by investors. Informational efficiency says, look, if the price is 50 pounds, there is good reason for it. It is 50 pounds because that's the price investors think is right. If the expected return is as high as 10%, that's because 
investors see some risk and discount the future, expect the future payoffs of this asset by 10%, okay, to derive the current price. It's 10% because investors demand 10% return from this asset. If investors think, okay, this company's share is moderately safe, so I wouldn't demand such a high risk premium, 8% would be enough. I want only 8% expected return from this company. If the actual return is 10%, then investors would buy it. Demand goes up, the price goes up. If the current price goes up, the expected return goes down to 8%. Yeah? This is very important point. Expect return is different from expected temperature or expected GDP. Expected return being 10% means that investors want 10% expected return. Okay? Does that make sense? If investors think, no, this asset is too risky, I want, we want 12%. If the actual return is 10%, demand goes down, the price goes down. If price goes down, the expected return goes up to 12%. Yeah? So the expected return is actually investors' discount rate. Investors discount future payoffs by that rate. Okay? That's the expected return or return investors demand from that asset. Is this interpreta uh, interpretation of expected return clear? It's not mathematical difficulty, but it's very philosophically important. Now, this information efficiency doesn't contradict to return unpredictability or return predictability. Well, the return unpredictability, Martingale hypothesis says that the expected return, the expectation of future return based on the current information, doesn't depend on current information. It's always constant. Before the scandal, the expected return of Volkswagen was 5%. Now the scandal uh, is revealed. The, future, the prospect of future payoffs of this company plunges. The current price also plunges. And after the scandal, it's, the expected return can still be 5% if investors always want 5% expected return from this company. Predictability return means, I mean, the information efficiency says that the price and expected return should be immediately adjusted upon the arrival of new information. And that adjusted level can be constant or it can be time varying. OK? So the information efficiency doesn't contradict to predictability or unpredictability of future returns. Now this information efficiency is philosophically important, but it doesn't have much testable implication. So let us go back to return predictability. <laughs> 